hello everybody a uh, very warm good evening and i my sincere thanks to all of you for dedicating yourself on this one hour session on uh, learning uh, on the tech areas and attending it on a work day so with that uh, i would like to get started with the today's session let me just share my screen uh, i hope all of you can see my screen arvin you can see my screen yeah i can see the screen yes yeah thank you so uh, so dear all uh, let us have a, a, a wonderful session on how to choose a right tech stack for a saas product uh, in one hour today here is a brief agenda what exactly we're going to discuss uh, in this one hour the first is an introduction to understand what is a saas product and what is a tech stack in the context of saas uh, all about uh, these are all you know there could be a varied set of audiences who could be beginners and uh, i'm also sure that this is some not something new many of you might be aware of uh, what saas product but just to normalize the definition among the audience today i'm starting with an introduction then we shall get onto a roadmap for developing your own saas application platforms from scratch what are the typical milestones and the building blocks for developing a saas product then the third point is we shall discuss the business context of saas and some of the two primary areas uh, in the business context which are relevant for us to choose uh, a tech stack are business models the pricing strategies and the the key business requirements then we shall get on to the key topic of the day that is tech stack for saas development some of the key component areas uh, comprising the particular tech stack then what are the factors influencing the choice of our tech stack then we shall discuss about some of the best practices for selecting the right tech stack for your saas product then finally a walk through of a simple example of a tech stack of a saas product then uh, we shall open for a 100% q&a however this need not be uh, at the end i will give you a, a certain time at a particular intervals i will pause for a while to uh, you know uh, get look forward to your questions so that i can answer for uh, to the to my best capacity so with that let's start an introduction what is saas product and what is a tech stack all about let us delve into some of the areas here uh, a definition of a saas and how is it different from a traditional software then a brief history from emerging technology to ubiquity at the current uh, industry some of the popular saas products in the current market and what is tech stack in the context of a saas product so let us try to understand what is a saas product saas is an acronym for software as a service it's a way we, a software is delivered it's a cloud based delivery model enabling users to access software servers databases and code through internet which allows the creation of applications accessible from multiple devices without the need for purchasing or installation or maintenance as opposed to a traditional software So SaaS brings seamless workflow capabilities to users anywhere and anytime revolutionizing how companies operate So in a SaaS delivery model a software vendor or any independent software company can host the application that they would like to service a particular function in cloud and license the same for consumers or users to subscribe and use those functions uh, in a pay, uh, in a different or multiple uh, pricing strategies which we will discuss later some of the typical uh, uh, saas products that we are currently using on a day to day basis are google apps uh, dropbox zoom and netflix and many more and if you see each of these uh, saas products will perform a specific function which caters to the specific need of a consumer so what exactly how is it different from a traditional software so traditional software is like how we started with 30 years ago is like you know if you remember the lotus software and microsoft office products and all of these they were like a traditional installable software it's like one time fee you purchase the software and install it in your laptop or a pc with one user uh, or with uh, one Uh, device and if you have to use the same in another device either you have to uninstall from the old uh, device which you have installed or you have to purchase another license uh, for, in order to install it in second device 
So how is it different um, like a SaaS, as we already discussed, like SaaS is an internet based. Uh, you do not have to install anything on your PC or uh, your laptop, and it is uh, easily accessible in multiple devices. Like Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime Video, you might have been using it in multiple devices, right? Um, your phones, tablets, PCs, and laptops, etc. So and we uh, subscribe to a particular period and we'll start using these uh, SaaS softwares on a day-to-day -day basis. How did it evolve? How did we reach here from traditional software uh, scenarios uh, to the current SaaS economy? So some of the pre-SaaS era we already see is PCs and traditional software installations were used in per device and per user based. Uh, over a period of time, the Emergence of cloud computing led to uh, a lot of uh, uh, new ecosystems, like you know the application ecosystem in web and mobile really evolved. With the cloud computing uh, emergence, uh, people were able to access the resources of a PC globally and remotely. It gave an immense potential to uh, you know expand the delivery of software as well through uh, cloud computing. So in fact, SaaS is just a delivery of the software services through a cloud uh, computing platforms. So one of the, uh, the first uh, SaaS product uh, that's been developed and released in the uh, history in 1999 is by Salesforce. They started uh, and released a first SaaS product for CRMs. Uh, for startups and uh, small and medium enterprises. They had many uh, and innumerable number of challenges in terms of scalability, code, maintenance, publishing softwares, but still they could uh, uh, you know, successfully achieve it through all the struggles uh, for uh, SMEs. And from, from then onwards, uh, multiple companies, multiple products uh, have been reached and SaaS has reached its ubiquity to the enterprise level, not just from the uh, individual or startups or uh, small and medium enterprises, but nowadays each and every enterprise uh, will have their own SaaS products for each functionality with a lot of integrations to the external uh, ecosystem. And now SaaS is at a place where, you know, even uh, an individual day-to-day life of an individual uh, has also changed in the way uh, we access the content, the way we subscribe to the services uh, in our day-to-day -day operations to the enterprise level. Some of the popular SaaS products in the market, of course, are not limited to these, but there are many more innumerable number of SaaS products, but some of the most popular ones which I could uh, capture here is you know, Asana. Um, it's a project management uh, SaaS product. And uh, each of these SaaS products has its own uh, individual purpose and function. Zoom, specifically used for um, uh, video conferencing, HubSpot for CRM, Slack for um, uh, the communication channel, then Zendesk we have for servicing the tickets, Salesforce, uh, Trello, Trello is for another project management tool, DocuSign, signing the documents, uh, I know, um, each of these uh, SaaS products, what I have mentioned here, it caters to B2C as well as uh, B2B um, uh, space. That means enterprise level as well as an individual level. Then we have service now, Shopify, Freshdesk, and uh, Netflix. So Freshdesk, uh, you know, it helps us to have a, a uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard this uh, Freshdesk uh, uh, SaaS product. It helps us to take the calls of a particular uh, product or a service. So we can onboard a customer support uh, through uh, Freshdesk for any of the companies. Shopify, it helps us to have an, our own uh, e-commerce space of our product and services. And Netflix, which we know it's a popular uh, video streaming uh, SaaS product. So what is a tech stack for a SaaS product all about? Uh, just to give a brief uh, definition of uh, tech stack here is tech stack is defined as a set of technologies, an organization or a software vendor uses to build a SaaS uh, based application. It's a combination of programming languages, frameworks, libraries, design patterns, servers, UI UX solutions, software and tools used by its developers. 
The diagram you see on the left side, uh, it depicts uh, some of the areas um, like a front end, back end operating system, data storage and querying, servers and load balancing, monitoring and performance tools. These are the functional blocks of a typical tech stack. And on the right side, there are other applications which will help us to facilitate. Uh, it could be like a BI tools, product analytics tools, API testing frameworks, then it could be a test framework, it could be a cloud hosting solution provider. So these are the other applications which will help us to facilitate the delivery of the SaaS uh, tech product in a smoother and more uh, efficient way. So that's, now let's delve into the roadmap to develop a SaaS application from scratch. So these are on a very high level. Uh, building blocks, uh, what I have mentioned, uh, not well deeper because the context of our uh, topic is to delve deeper into the tech stack choices. But this is just an overview of how the other areas will help uh, us in influencing the selection of our tech stack. So the first thing is uh, we have to conduct a market research for the specific business problem or a specific uh, business function that we are catering to serve. Now uh, in the market, so it involves um, uh, a lot of um, I know surveys. It could be it uh, it involves the competitor analysis. It involves the analysis of pricing and many many other areas. And fundamentally, we have to evaluate the need of a business uh, problem uh, which we are trying to serve through our product. Then once we are aware of, once we are clear of this, then you start uh, creating a solid business plan comprising of uh, the, the key functional area uh, of the uh, SaaS product. Along with that, we should also have a plan for pricing business models and the key business requirements, the target audience that we are catering to, uh, the operational plan, the development team, sales and marketing team, everything will uh, come in this solid business plan. But one of the key important uh, area uh, in the business plan is the pricing strategies uh, and the uh, you know the the key uh, industry requirements that we capture uh, in the business plan are two areas uh, which drive us towards uh, you know which one uh, which tech stack uh, we need to choose for this business tech requirement. Next, we are determining the SaaS product functional requirement in a deeper sense, like you know, it may involve uh, securities, it may involve whether we want a web or a mobile feature, or what exactly the customer uh, really wants in terms of the business processes uh, in order for the customer to improve his business efficiency. All of those functional requirements will become another key factor. So the, the blocks which are uh, colored in yellow, these two blocks are the key indicators for us to really select which tech stack is more suitable for our SaaS product. Then once, once we are uh, you know, a little clear with these requirements, we do not delve directly into the development test and launch phase, but it's, it's always prudent to develop an MVP uh, to uh, dipstick the market uh, response and uh, how the customers are really perceiving our product and is that really serving the need of a customer. So developing an MVP will help us uh, to get more clarity on our direction of our product uh, development scenario. So once we get a couple of feedbacks uh, after developing an MVP, then we can choose a good tech stack which will help us to scale and, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop this product in a more stable way to the needs of the customers. Once we choose a good tech stack, we set up a development team and then we develop, test and launch. So some of the business context of SaaS, what exactly, why are we uh, doing this as obviously to, uh, you know, be in business uh, and to make some profits, but what are the key driving factors uh, for us to really consider in the context of business, which will further uh, drive us to select a good tech stack is the, the business models. The business models, uh, there are some of the areas which I've mentioned here are, it could be a free or a freemium model, wherein you know, we can uh, uh, you know, let the consumer start free and go for a premium based features, or we can avoid the ad if he wants to really pay for the entire uh, services. The second uh, business model is uh, per active 
uh, user pricing. A Slack is one of the typical example wherein you know uh, any active user uh, number of active users uh, at the current moment or a duration they have been uh, priced for those many number of uh, users. Pay as you go model uh, based on the consumption of the services or the features you you, you are uh, paying as much as you consume. So you won't be paying everything upfront. Then per user model is again, uh, it is uh, like, you know, for those many, these many number of users, uh, uh, the license is given as uh, one of the pricing uh, business model. Then we have a tired pricing uh, model wherein the features are tired in the sense that, you know, okay, a couple of features like basic features and intermediate features and uh, advanced features are tired uh, in, a, in a bunch of uh, you know, packages and we opt for either intermediate or we opt for enterprise level uh, complete uh, features, etc. Then we also have a flat rate pricing wherein uh, uh, we pay 100% uh, whatever is needed for all the features. We just pay 100% maybe annually or a full time or a lifetime. Then we get all the features uh, at one time. So some of the business features uh, which are key driving factors for a tech stack are security features. Security features uh, which we are delving in little more detail in the upcoming slides. The user friendliness, how uh, seamlessly we build our UI UX experience with the applications. Then uh, whether the requirement re uh, need only mobile or only web or both hybrid. Then the other uh, requirement is support and maintenance in real time. This is very crucial uh, because uh, while the application is under use by many customers, uh, we have to still support uh, bug fixing the new feature additions, etc. So how are we doing this, achieving this without disrupting the current users is the key here. Then multi-tenancy infrastructure. There are uh, various um, alternatives for a SaaS product uh, in order to select a particular architecture, which we are again delving deeper in the upcoming slides. Now, what are the uh, you know, key components of a tech stack? So far, we have uh, understood what exactly is a SaaS product uh, fundamentally and uh, what are the business context of a SaaS product. Now, let's get on to the key topic of the day-to-day uh, -day is, you know, what are the key components of a technology stack? So the first component is a uh, front-end, uh, which might be, uh, you know, for web or a mobile, it is uh, facing the user or the consumer. Then we have the second component, backend, which basically serves the, uh, all the functionalities are serviced in the backend and it will be uh, sent to front-end for user uh, for further consumption. The third important component is we have to decide in the tech stack is the SaaS architecture, which is like a single tenancy or multi-tenancy based on the kind of product that we are developing and also the interactions between the front end and the back end. And the fourth important component is the databases. What kind of database we are using for our SaaS product? All of these key components, we shall look into it in detail. Uh, in that slides. The fifth component is identity access management. Uh, this is one component which will help us to onboard users or consumers based on the, uh, the roles, based on the groups in the organization and uh, what are the authentication, uh, authentication and authorization levels that need to be provided for each customer whom we are onboarding. And the next component is an application security. Application security involves uh, um, multiple layers. Again, uh, the key management, whether the data is encrypted, uh, are we providing an authentication authorization to the right set of uh, consumers? Is it exposed to public internet? Is it a part of the uh, private uh, workspace? And is it accessible only through virtual private network? All of these uh, are dealt in the application security component. Then a couple of uh, below uh, set of uh, uh, components are supporting components to the main tech stack. Say for example, DevOps tools, if we need it to in order to facilitate the continuous integration and development and deployments to the cloud environment. Then we have to select a particular uh, uh, good test automation framework, which will help us to write test cases and automate the tests, especially front-end 
uh, to automate the user clicks and backend automate the API testing uh, because every SaaS product is, uh, you know, in the it, it is complex in its own sense, even though the functionality might be small, but the complexity of the stack, the interaction of the components and everything might be more such that, you know, a manual testing is not something really advisable. So we need to have a proper automation framework for testing uh, both front end, back end and uh, the integration testing features. And the next component is the cloud hosting providers. So we have to, uh, as SaaS, we already know by now that you know it is delivered through cloud hosting providers. So we need to select a, a suitable cloud hosting service provider to host this entire application stack. Then um, we have a monitoring and performance tools. These tools will help us to really understand uh, the user behavior or of which area of the product, which area of the uh, product features are doing well and which are not doing well. So this will help us to really fine tune our uh, entire tech stack or our entire product feature in a better manner uh, so that you know the in insights provided by this, provided by these tools are really valuable in the sense that how how we can in keep on improvising our SaaS product. What is the user behavior here and where is user really focusing on? And we can focus the strength of the product rather than, you know, there could be a lot of, uh, you know, the waste resources uh, lying around which may not be used at all. So monitoring performance tools will really help us identify those areas and quickly fine tune um, and position our product uh, for better, uh, user consumption. So with this, uh, before dwelling deeper into each of these areas, uh, I'd like to pause for a minute and uh, take any questions. Anybody has any questions uh, so far? No questions, thanks. Okay. Okay, so okay, okay, this is Arvind Thank here. Uh, I have a yeah. question. So you sure. have one slide which uh, showed the process. Uh, so I think there was there were two boxes colored in yellow. That slide. So yes. okay. here, uh, I my question is about developing the MVP. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you can comment on this. Some people would have thought like choosing a good tech tech stack comes before developing an MVP. Yeah. So, what is so then, that? yes, yes, absolutely. It's a very uh, valid question here. In fact, even I was thinking the same. But uh, the MVP sometimes need not be uh, in the current uh, uh, UI/UX design uh, ecosystem. It need not be a complete, full-fledged product functionally running. It could be a phase where you know we can do a lot of prototyping, and uh, with the prototyping itself, we can uh, get a lot of good feedback. And and it is a uh, it is a decision that we uh, every source product uh, company can make whether they want to start with a good tech stack and then develop an MVP, or they would like to do an MVP with the prototyping features of the the latest uh, UI UX tools. Get the first customer feedback on a very initial stages, and then we choose or parallelly do the good tech stack. It is uh, a scenario which is open to both depending on the budget, depending on the skill sets that uh, we have. Uh, in the system, but uh, the best practice is to, you know, definitely select a good uh, uh, tech stack, which you can start with and have an MVP uh, ready so that customers will have a feel of a, a product which is very close to the technology. But m most of the startups which I have worked with, it is like uh, majorly, um, it's a very tricky situation. So we will take a call based subjective calls based on what is the situation at that particular moment. So I hope that answers your question, Arvind. Yeah, so yeah. you can always got some clarity uh, on that. In fact, there yes. is merit in both approaches. Uh, in yes. this case, when we develop the MVP, I think it should mm -hmm. be stressed that the team should not spend too much time developing the MVP. Absolutely. And then because after that, if they decide to change the tech stack, all that effort would be wasted. Absolutely. So Absolutely. When the MVP is developed first, they should do it quickly just to get a sense of the market, whether the product yes. fits the market. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Follow up on the same slide. 
you mentioned about functional requirements mm -hmm. but you know in fast world you know you will have millions of at least assumption is that you want to make money by selling it to multiple customers okay millions of customers mm -hmm. at what stage you will start looking at non functional requirements and would that impact you know choosing the stack so uh so initially uh, when we are conducting the market research itself we know the kind of audience we are catering to majorly you know it's a, it's a b2c or a b2b etc so those kind of a clarity you would have already got while you are doing the market research now the there could be innumerable within that space there could be innumerable number of problems that you are trying to address but as i mentioned earlier the one key problem that you are trying to solve which caters to 90% of the users uh, is something you have to pick it up as the primary function of the product so uh, when we are doing that the first feature is what exactly we are catering to that particular business problem say for example uh, zoom is a particular product so zoom product it always knows that you know okay it is catering to the requirements of video conferencing or uh, tele uh, teleconferencing it's just a conferencing tool now we know that the key requirement here is the conferencing tool and this conferencing tool we know that you know since it's a little complex product we have to cater this only to the enterprises individuals might come later but we know that you know we have to cater this to enterprise enterprises who will use this day in and day out so your scalability you are already clear the enterprise customers who use this particular zoom tool is you know you know that scale at which you have to cater to now when you know that this is the scale that you have to cater to now your tech stack is automatically uh, align should align to that scalability so you know that it cannot just work with uh, some simple couple of uh, laptops or just a couple of devices so the tech stack should primary thing is to address the scalability at that particular for that particular software yeah in what stage in the cycle you know you have some clarity of numbers there yes so when you are determining the product functional uh, requirement that is the stage wherein you know you have to be clear with majorly you have to be clear with your uh, you know uh, the numbers uh, especially developing an mvp may only uh, help you to validate your assumptions okay whatever you have assumed it has been working but uh, determining the product functional requirement is a stage at which it will uh, you have to be really clear on your uh, you know uh, your the core uh, key strengths which will directly impact your uh, selection of a, a good text so that's why i have put determining the saas product functional requirement is the, is a time wherein you know that will really influence your good tech stack and some of the features is like if it is an enterprise you know that it has to be secure enough you know that their data has to be secure so the security features uh, will become a part of uh, selecting your good tech stack at that particular moment now scalability means especially the databases the databases uh, when you are selecting the how far it is scalable and the cloud service uh, uh, hosting provider uh whether will it will they serve the scale because this month you will have very less number of users but the next month you have to really scale up so in such a scenario uh, database becomes really crucial to scale immediately to your application needs then at that particular moment you have to really be careful in choosing your database plus the cloud hosting service provider which will host those uh, databases and how uh, how configurable the cloud hosting service provider allows you to scale the databases quickly so the stage at which to answer your question precisely is determining software product functional requirement is the key driving factor for you to directly select a good tech stack and while you are developing an mvp if your uh, assumptions become invalid you may only fine tune it okay you may change here and there okay this is not working that's not working let's change it here but the primary stage is, is you are determining the saas product uh, functional requirement stage at which you have to it's a very uh, important uh, uh, you know influencing space 
to directly uh, select your tech stack. And also, is there any impact of you know um, known uh, development culture which will impact all these? Like for example, if people talk about a value stream or you know platform engineering where DevOps is separate. Mm -hmm. so, you you have different kind of execution culture, right? Yes, yes. So that I will come. I will cover it little yeah. later. Yeah. So the 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 choice that we make with the good tech stack, it has its own um, uh, influences. The quality of the product, quality of the company, quality of the team, and how effectively the team delivers, and all those things we will cover it in the upcoming uh, slides. Okay. Finally, one more question. Yeah. Do you see sure. any impact on? Uh, constrained budget and time. Where would that be taken care? Definitely, it has a very huge impact. So when we are doing a solid business plan, the budget uh, it will uh, there is also a byproduct of a business plan. Within the business plan, there is an operational plan. There is a project plan. There is a, a development uh, team uh, plan. So all of those plans are done here. And the key decisions are uh, made here uh, in order to really, uh, you know, drive uh, the decisions from that to the next set of phases. So the 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 business plan will have a little deeper areas, but in fact, there is also a project plan which I have not mentioned. This is a very high level roadmap. There are many, many more uh, deeper um, uh, milestones, inner milestones within each of these uh, block. Yeah, but uh, the project plan will definitely uh, tell us once we are ready with the functional requirement. Uh, uh, we will it will definitely have an impact. The developer skills, uh, the budget, the timelines, all of these will have a definite uh, impact on whether it's a good tech stack or um, we cannot say good or uh, bad also sometimes. Uh, there are many trade-offs on each of the choices that we make. So it will it will definitely have an impact. Yeah. yeah, sure. So let's move on to the next um, uh, course of uh, components. Like I would like to start with the front end of a SaaS application. Uh, we, uh, uh, many of us might be aware here that a front end, uh, typically a fundamental components are HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but over a period of time, uh, that these three components has evolved to, uh, you know, different frameworks. Uh, like what I have mentioned here, Bootstrap, Angular, React, UJS, Flutter, Ionic, React Native. Many of these uh, frameworks will cater to the front end development uh, activity. Uh, uh, here we uh, select the framework based on uh, whether we want only the web or only mobile or hybrid. Flutter, Ionic, React Native are all React Native and Ionic are all mobile only based. So if you're a SaaS product, you are very sure of only mobile. So you can go with uh, those frameworks. Or if you want a hybrid, you can choose um, other uh, frameworks like Angular, React, Vue, Flutter, and uh, Bootstrap. So this is about the front end of a, a SaaS application. Then we'll come to the back end of SaaS application, wherein you know back end comprises of multiple components, as the picture depicts here. We have servers, databases, security, APIs. These are all functional uh, areas of back end. Business logic, operating system, scalability, frameworks, data analysis, system architecture, and uh, many more. So. Uh, the the typical and the most popular uh, backend frameworks uh, based on a particular language I have mentioned here. JavaScript uh, we can choose Node.js, Meteor.js, or uh, Express.js. PHP uh, uh, side we have Laravel or Codeigniter. Then on Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Uh, Python, uh, which is most popular uh, backend frameworks, uh, we use Django predominantly, but we also have uh, Flask. If you are selecting Scala, then you can go with the play uh, frameworks. Uh, the standard servers uh, are Apache, Nginx, and IIS, and all these are hosted on uh, cloud. Then we have to select a SaaS architecture. We have uh, uh, predominantly three standard architectures uh, when we are selecting or developing a SaaS product. 
we have a single tenant architecture, multi tenant, and a mixed tenant. Single tenant means uh, we have each consumer or a customer uh, will have uh, his own instance of a software application and uh, his own instance of a DB. This is a single tenant architecture. So uh, there will be uh, for every customer we uh, onboard with our SaaS product, then we will have a replica of the softwares that we uh, have developed and the corresponding DBs for each consumer. Whereas in multi-tenant, we have multiple, uh, for multiple users, we have one app instance and we have one DB instance. Consumers will have uh, an access to the same application and same DB. However, in the, within the database, the data is logically divided uh, based on the consumer. Uh, but uh, from the physical instance perspective, we have only one instance of the database. In the case of we have another third uh, type of uh, you know SaaS architecture called mixed tenant. In this case, we have uh, we have uh, uh, multiple uh, users, but each user will access uh, one in instance of an application. But uh, that application will access multiple databases. Uh, that means each user will have a different database, but one instance of an application. There are pros and cons uh, on selecting uh, each of these SaaS architectures. So one is what are the benefits and drawbacks of a single tenant architecture? So it all depends on the uh, kind of an application or a SaaS product we are building. One is the, the key benefits of a single tenant are they are highly secured uh, in terms of the data security. Customization, each uh, application will have an in its own uh, instance to a particular consumer. So in such a case, we have uh, we can allow a lot of customization to that individual customer uh, based on his or her requirements. Then we can port the data easily. Uh, we can have a lot of backups because each data is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, uh, one single uh, customer. So we can have our own uh, port uh, data with respect to that uh, single customer. Now, what are the drawbacks here is it is very complex to set up and management managing for if we have 100 uh, customers, it's not really scalable solution. Then uh, it will it is very uh, costly in terms of you know each each uh, uh, tenant, each consumer having his or her, her own environment leads to a lot of uh, heavy costs as well as you know it might be very inefficient resource uh, usage in terms of time. So but still there are many uh, uh, companies use single tenant because of uh, you know, strong privacy requirements and which is the domain which uh, go for generally go for single tenancy is the healthcare and fintech. Healthcare companies, uh, they have to be uh, generally HIPAA compliant in protecting the patient's data, especially. That's where, you know, uh, healthcare providers generally go for single tenant solutions and most of their products are on premise. Then uh, FinTech, uh, as we all know that the finance data is also equally sensitive uh, in uh, many of the corporate or an enterprise uh, level. In these two spaces, generally uh, single tenancy uh, is used. How about multi-tenancy? Multi-tenancy benefits are it's very easy to deploy because we have only one app instance. We have to maintain only one application uh, for to cater to multiple customers. Then the, it has a very uh, we can use uh, efficient uh, resource uh, uh, usage of uh, the entire cloud infrastructure. The costs are reduced because of one instance uh, and one uh, instance of application and one instance of database. What are the typical drawbacks? Of course, uh, it uh, it uh, gives us a, a greater uh, security risk because most of the data uh, is uh, residing in a single instance and many consumers may not be comfortable with their data that's been stored in the same place where other customers' data is also stored. Though they are logically divided, it does not give a uh, you know, great comfort to uh, users. Then lack of uh, cost visibility. When we are onboarding uh, multiple customers using the same application and same database, how are we exactly? One customer might be using our application less, but whereas other customer might be using more. So how do we really give, you know, how do we differentiate the cost for uh, each of these customers? So this is not really transparent and clear in the case of multi-tenancy. But still, we use uh, multi-tenancy in major consumer-facing applications which doesn't require a strong uh, security concerns. So most of the 
B2C uh, SaaS products are all multi-tenancy based because of the benefits and okay to compromise on the drawbacks at the cost of uh, you know, better benefits. Then we have next component uh, databases. We all know database is the primary key uh, you know, uh, to store all our data, one of the primary important component in the tech stack. We have varied uh, set of uh, databases. We have heard about uh, SQL, NoSQL databases like MongoDB, cache databases like Redis, and enterprise uh, databases like Oracle, uh, Amazon Redshift, then Cassandra, Google BigQuery. All of these, uh, you know, will bring in their own uh, pros and cons depending on the kind of scale at which we are working and uh, the kind of performance that we would like to. Uh, you know, uh, achieve, we are selecting either of these uh, databases. So sometimes it will be a combination of multiple databases. We may have to store both structured as well as unstructured um, uh, unstructured data. Sometimes uh, like a, a, a databases uh, like MongoDB are used in uh, very unstructured uh, applications, uh, data like Trello, uh, et cetera, in order to achieve uh, a smooth uh, performance, but still we don't have to store much of a structured data. Uh, so these are a uh, couple of uh, common, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, trade-offs and the requirements which will help us uh, in deciding uh, the kind of database that we would like to get into. And especially when we're using uh, AWS, we always go by Amazon uh, Redshift, uh, which will give us a better performance uh, in the Amazon ecosystem. Then we need to have tools like uh, DevOps tools, uh, comprises of uh, Docker, Kubernetes, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, uh, Terraform, Travis CI, Jira, Confluence, Gradle, and Ansible. There are many configuration management tools here, as well as the non-functional uh, uh, tools like Jira or Confluence. But all, all of these tools will help us uh, achieve the deployments uh, seamlessly to the cloud service providers. Terraform is one of the uh, platform which will help us uh, to write scripts and automate our uh, deployments. And it can also be used like, you know, it's platform agnostic. We can support uh, AWS scripts or GCP or uh, even Microsoft Azure, et cetera, to create the entire infrastructure, deploy it, and we can even destroy it. So Terraform is one of the tool which we can use during the MVP that, you know, it's like a temporary testing. You create it, uh, you experiment, uh, do all the configurations. Okay, if this works, uh, fine, you can continue with that uh, infrastructure or you can change the configurations in the Terraform, which will build a new uh, infrastructure with the new configurations. And you can do this in the MVP stage. Still, you are very clear about the performance of the infrastructure that you have selected. And the best part of Terraform is like, you know, same infrastructure, you can um, write with different scripts of Azure library uh, or uh, with the GCP. We know that, you know, we are okay that uh, we should go with the MongoDB so we can use a corresponding components uh, in the scripts like AWS or Azure or uh, GCP. So, so the infrastructure is defined, but we can use uh, different scripts for different uh, uh, cloud service providers, which will help us to stabilize our, our uh, infrastructure environment. And GitHub Actions is uh, one of the simple tool uh, which will help us to deploy from GitHub to the cloud uh, infrastructure. So we can configure the resources uh, which we have defined uh, in our cloud environment and whether back end or front end, any of these components, we can deploy through the, the GitHub action, Actions seamlessly. Jenkins, uh, uh, it will help us. Uh, it is a uh, you know bigger framework. It has uh, uh, beyond GitHub Actions. It has uh, more uh, features. Like we can include uh, Docker containerization. We can also include the testing frameworks. While you test, you after testing based on the results you deploy. So there are many more plugins in the Jenkins environments, which will help us facilitate uh, the deployments uh, smoothly. Then we have Docker. Uh, Docker is used for uh, backend services, especially uh, any of the backend frameworks. We containerize it and uh, are using uh, Docker's, or it, it could be a Kubernetes. It's another orchestration tool uh, of uh, containerization. So, wherein you know, all the backend services are predominantly packaged and uh, deployed for deployed in the cloud environments. 
then we have uh, test automation frameworks wherein uh, we uh, we have uh, some of the predominant uh, uh, tools used in this uh, space is selenium and uh, cypress then postman for uh, api testing uh, rest are all you know we can use uh, uh, definitely they are all uh, enterprise uh, ones we can uh, definitely use apm and browser stack to really test our application in uh, different browsers and to understand our application performance with analytics apm is the best tool uh, but these are all paid versions uh, but uh, the free ones are you know the selenium uh, is the most uh, uh, widely used uh, automation framework to test uh, uh, the front end uh, especially and postman for api testing then we have uh, innumerable number of uh, cloud hosting uh, service providers. Predominantly, uh, the first uh, top three are the ones uh, dominating the market, especially AWS, then Microsoft Azure and uh, Google Cloud Platform. But there are other cloud service providers as well, DigitalOcean. We can start with DigitalOcean if needed for an MVP phase and uh, just see, see to it that you know our component selections, configurations are all fine. Then we can move on to the AWS when we are actually getting on to the uh, uh, tech stack or Azure or GCP. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of uh, other service uh, providers in the enterprise uh, who are dominant, uh, IBM, Oracle, and uh, VMware cloud environments, wherein uh, they, are, um, they can be selected based on uh, uh, the kind of uh, unique strengths, like VMware cloud, they have a lot of virtual machines. Um, Oracle Cloud, if you are really using the Oracle uh, databases and IBM products, uh, if you are using any of the IBM uh, products, then uh, we can use any of these uh, cloud hosting service providers. But uh, anything required for scale, then AWS is the, uh, the best uh, cloud service provider, uh, which will uh, give us a lot of uh, good uh, uh, technical support as well uh, and in terms of technical documentation also uh, it's very well uh, written maintained and uh, updated then we have identity access management system this is something this module is used to onboard a customer uh, with the number of users uh, we have we can uh, configure a role-based access management. We can also configure the set of groups they belong within uh, a particular enterprise. And uh, we can authorize, uh, authenticate and authorize. Authorize uh, will uh, help a particular user to be restricted only to a couple of features uh, within uh, the entire source product. So there are a couple of tools like Open IAM, Keyclock, Okta, uh, Microsoft Azure Active Directory, One Login, IBM Security, Oracle IAM. Uh, but Keyclock is a, a, a widely used um, open source tool. You can get started with Keyclock uh, if you are in MVP stage and see to it that you know you are very clear with your requirements and stuff like that. Then you can move on to any specific customer requirements. Like you know, majorly many of the enterprise customers will have uh, Microsoft Azure Active Directory as their identity access management. So if our SaaS product has to be integrated with those uh, enterprise customers, then um, we can use uh, Active Directory integrations uh, with from Keyclock or any other uh, identity access management system to integrate seamlessly the existing users of the enterprise within the Active Directory. We can also have an LDAP configurations in uh, uh, Keyclock or Okta, where you know there is a lot of uh, companies use uh, LDAP as their primary uh, identity access management system. So we might have to integrate when we are delivering our solutions to an enterprise. They will have their own, um, you know, identity access management solution. So we may have to figure out its integrations with our SaaS product and see to it that you know we can access a one user base to perform this entire um, identity access management. Then we have a couple of monitoring uh, performance tools like uh, AppDynamics, New Relic, Dynatrace, Datadog, Google Analytics for product analytics. These monitoring tools will help us uh, to uh, gain insights into what areas of the uh, particular tech stack performing well and what areas uh, requires attention, what areas that uh, we do not have to consider. All of these, uh, you know, uh, AppDynamics especially is the uh, uh, 
you know the key player uh, in this space which will help us uh, okay front end is really performing with these so it will also help us to understand the the user behavior where exactly user um, users are focusing their uh, uh, features to consume so it will give a lot of insights on the user uh, behaviors so that you can really decide upon you know uh, the, the entire direction of your uh, saas then application security uh, this is a, another important area wherein you know the, there has to be a lot every application that has to be deployed has to be encrypted and there are a lot of key management uh, that comes into picture uh, in terms of accessing the resources in the cloud environment then we have to do a security monitoring uh, for uh, any of the attacks that uh, we encounter even aws is uh, uh, definitely vulnerable every cloud hosting service provider is vulnerable to uh, you know cyber attacks so we may have to continuously monitor put a lot of monitoring alerts uh, for each of the key resources each of the subnets we use each of the network interfaces we use such that you know uh, it will be uh, um, you know we will be alerted whenever there is a threat that occurs or any attack you know, happens then we may have to uh, have an incident response mechanism like sometimes the, even the uh, the best infrastructure resources may go down because of uh, various uh, dynamic uh, situations or the database um, uh, might uh, uh, no it might uh, come down the app application instance might crash so these are kind of uh, some of the incidents uh, that we have to monitor and see to it that you know uh, it will have a very less resumption time so we have something called as an ro rot and uh, you know we have to ensure that within a uh, few seconds we have to ensure that you know the system will be back on uh, back on track in servicing the customers we cannot afford any downtime uh, while the application is under use in the enterprise uh, level then we have integrations to company specific uh, security environments uh, each enterprise customer will have their own secured uh, uh, gateways uh, either through vpns uh, whitelisting uh, or saas product and many many other security specifics uh, each enterprise customer will have so we have to see to it that you know these integrations encompass uh, the security requirements of our saas product then data privacy uh, each database uh, has to be encrypted and it has to be a part of the private subnet uh, which cannot be accessed and it has to be accessed only through the backend application and uh, front end or any other public network cannot access uh, the databases this is something we have to ensure in the cloud infrastructure configuration then iam which we already discussed is also a part of the application security then we have to have two factor uh, authentication to make it more secure and access control see to it that the, every user will have a, a control access control to a specific feature depending on the organization policies or requirements now what are some of the major factors now uh, influencing the choice of tech stack so all these what we have learned is what are the each components of a tech stack now what factors influence us in selecting the tech stack majorly is code maintainability the tech stack that we select uh, any of the frameworks any of the programming languages and any of the configurations etc um, the whatever the the technology we select we we should be able to maintain it in the long run say for example there are many programming languages or technologies which become obsolete over a period of time and if we what if we choose that and our the entire uh, uh, you know the framework for a language is uh, becoming obsolete then we won't be able to maintain the code in the future so uh, that's one of the reason angular and react uh, in front end space and, and python though they are all uh, open source frameworks their maintainability of that um, uh, technology is so powerful there is a community support which is so powerful that you know people feel confident about uh, it in using those technologies in order to maintain it in a very long run the second influencing factor is the scalability requirements so the scalability is definitely one of the uh, key factor because every app we are not doing it just for today 
we have to look at the future and its roadmap and its consumption uh, how the user is grown how the features has to be uh, has to be made scalable etc so uh, in this scenario definitely the uh, the key component that we need to look into is the databases and the the choice of infrastructure uh, it should be such that you know it should always be scalable on demand so we do not know we cannot uh, you know envisage upfront okay this much we need this much of infrastructure capacity we need but it should be scalable enough based on the growing demand of our application maybe on a day to day basis or a weekly basis monthly or quarterly basis so with that the the best choice uh, especially on the cloud space is uh, aws or azure or uh, gcp but primarily aws gives a very good uh, scalability uh, it caters to scalability requirements uh, very well but the third important uh, influencing choice is the learning curve of a developer or the developer skill so we may be uh, uh, in need of react but uh, react developers are very scarce uh, uh, these days a good uh, react developer but a developer we uh, hire might already be aware of an angular uh, so there is always a learning curve for uh, you know any developer to adapt to the tech stack that we choose so we have to see to it that you know uh, try to majorly use uh, the developer skill sets but we cannot really compromise on the tech stack uh, we select because the tech stack we select is majorly driven by the uh, business requirements so there's no compromise on that but we have to have a trade off here and see to it that developers are quickly enabled uh, to cater to our uh, tech stack through various training programs and given some time uh, and the aptitude of the developer really matters here how quickly he can learn and deliver uh, is something we need to uh, really look into or uh, we may have to wait for our product uh, to be delivered shift the our time to market go to market and time to market strategies based on the uh, developers uh, skill and uh, their uh, uh you know readiness of uh, delivering product then the long term support uh, long term support is uh, you know something which is like once we launch the product it is ongoing the features bug fixes uh, and uh, any technical challenges especially the infrastructure infrastructure uh, long term support plays a very key role uh, in this particular uh, you know uh, scenario where any of the infrastructure goes down in fact not just a developer uh, of a front end or a back end can do it but it is beyond uh, any developer to do anything uh, if something happens to in the cloud end so we have to choose a cloud uh, service provider who has a very long term support uh, in our subscription and uh, they are very responsive uh, to our uh, requirements then yeah time to market uh is something we have to look at all the first four factors and then we have to really look at uh, time to market and see to it that you know uh, it is another major uh, factor in selecting our tech stack some of the best practices for selecting uh, right technologies so i would like to take a pause here any more questions so far on the key components of our tech stack uh, before i move on to the best practices uh hi uh, have you come across virtual eversity it's on it's it's, it's a it's a free uh, i mean you can, you can take some like courses and all that or it's for free but it's kind of a new thingy you know uh, okay. a new thing are you right so i mean it's the way they issue the certifications that is really kind of dodgy because mm -hmm. it's a kind of an FRM kind of thing, you see, which is based on a, a rank based sort of thing, you know, like mm -hmm. you have to try multiple times and all that, you see, mm -hmm. and then there's mm -hmm. a percentile and all that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I did try it and I took one, but the latest one, the blockchain, then I'm actually taking some other certifications. So, this virtual mm -hmm. reality, I took it a try because it's free, you know. Mm -hmm. So, actually, you know, they have some inter I've taken some on artificial intelligence, machine learning. I've done, mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing one on blockchain, but you know, they, they don't really Krishnan, explain. Uh, just hold yeah. on, Radha Krishnan. Maybe it is yeah. slightly off topic. We can discuss it. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but have you tried it or come across it? Virtual Evocity? Uh, yeah. No, uh, I have not tried. Uh, 
okay, it doesn't matter. I, I mean, I just want to say that, but it's, it's kind of not right. It's not a marks based system as such. You see, it's like a, a repeated trial and error sort of thing, more than anything else. That's what I want to say. Anyway, right. Okay. okay. So, any yeah. other relevant questions for this topic? No, no, I agree. Really else? One quick one. I, I did take uh, something on artificial intelligence and all that. Right. All of that. I have. Go, some. Yeah, go ahead, Ramnath. Yeah, one quick one. When we choose Docker, uh, Nginx or Apache is a necessity or uh, is that optional? No, no, it is a, a necessity. Um, uh, so Docker will have will run on top of the uh, Nginx or uh, some of the architectures are such that, you know, Nginx is made a part of uh, a Docker. So Docker comes up with an Nginx first and then the rest of the applications. But Nginx is it is not a choice between Nginx and Docker. It is a choice how you uh, orchestrate Nginx and Docker together to uh, do it, but you still need both. OK, thanks. Yeah. And how, how often we need to relook at the stack station? Revisiting the stack station? Uh, see, it is. Uh, uh, once we uh, once we select, it is definitely not advisable to keep changing it because you know every change involves a lot of technical debt and uh, it involves a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, reorientations and redeveloping. Say for example, it depends on the uh, what areas you are trying to change. If it is a complete revamp of front end, then whatever you worked on front end, you have to write from scratch with other frameworks. So you have to be very careful about those areas. If it is a matter of just a configuration in the cloud, then it is very uh, very small change. So it depends on the gravity of uh, the kind of uh, area which you are trying to address. So it's definitely not advisable unless you have a serious performance issues like a couple of SaaS products uh, in the history. Uh, this uh, many SaaS products uh, started with Java and Java Spring Boot uh, frameworks, etc. But uh, they had to encounter a serious uh, performance issues. Then they rewrote everything with Angular and uh, Python. So these are the cases. So unless it is a real major block. Uh, you know, uh, it is not, not advisable to uh, change. But if you have to, if the change is inevitable, then you have to do it. But unless it is a real major performance issue of uh, the how about, how about version upgrade? For version upgrade, uh, it again depends. In the, every version upgrade, uh, what what new features uh, you know you are providing, which is impacting the uh, the tech stack. So you might have to add a new library or a new plugin for an existing tech stack uh, for the new feature, then it is fine. There's nothing to change. It is just an addition. But if you really want in the next version, you want to improve your performance drastically uh, because the version one is way too bad and version two, you really want to improve it, then there might be certain impacts on the tech stack what you selected. It depends on which area the performance uh, is really a bottleneck. Is it a back end area or a front end area? Yeah, it, it all depends. So it depends. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, subjective to security. People may want to upgrade. Like a major security uh, flag, then you may want to upgrade. In the next yeah, version so they might have fixed that. Yes. So uh, security also, whether it is a cloud uh, security in cloud or security in database, uh, security in um, uh, you know in the application like a key cloth. So it is again, it depends. Uh, again, it is there is no uh, one uh, uh, stop uh, answer, full stop answer to this. So it depends on uh, the kind of area which you are trying to address it in the security space also. It has a very um, many, many layers, many, many areas. Uh, you know, security is a very itself is a very vast uh, uh, area now in cyber security. Things are uh, evolving. So if it is just a configuration issue, we would like to avoid uh, certain threats. Then it is just a matter of configuring the changes in the cloud environment. So you do not need a major uh, shift in the uh, stack. However, you really want to adapt an Active Directory support. 
uh, to enable users of a particular enterprise to access only through Active Directory. You do not want to be on onboarded uh, manually. So from key clock to Active Directory, it's a major uh, tech stack change. So it depends on the kind of uh, requirement you are catering to on that particular time. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, we are running short of time. Yeah. Maybe we can yeah. cover the best practices. Yeah. yeah. So, you, uh, so if you want to build a next uh, gen SaaS product, choose a tech stack that leverages one or more of these technologies. All of us know that you know AI ML uh, is uh, you know uh, the key uh, driving factor in many of the products. Five uh, G network, cloud computing, blockchain, virtual and augmented reality, Internet of Things, and uh, digital twins. See to it that you know you are leveraging all of these technologies such that you know you are uh, you know always uh, in the you know, next gen uh, uh, ecosystem of uh, SaaS products. Now, uh, and uh, the one of the practices, as I already mentioned, especially the SaaS architecture, is like it depends largely on the product requirements and the domain of the product, whether it's healthcare, fintech, or edutech. Now, the third important uh, practice we need to look at is the developer skill and their learning curve is an uh, essential factor. So you have to majorly, so it is always a trade-off, so whether you first decide a tech stack and then hire a developer, then you are very clear about uh, the developer uh, skill sets, which you need to look at. Uh, if you are a startup or if you already have developers, then you have to enable uh, uh, them to your uh, tech stack. Other best practice uh, when you are writing front end and back end is to ensure that you know they run independently in the different domains, so that you know you will have a better scalability features. The development uh, will happen uh, in parallel with a different set of uh, developers, and testing is also very uh, seamless and. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can uh, uh, decouple uh, the front end and plug and play to other uh, back end services or back end can be given a different a new head, new front end uh, altogether. These are, this is the one of the best practice to see to it that, you know, they are separated uh, in terms of programming. And even within back end, if the program is too complex, we get into the microservice architecture where within back end, each function is one microservice and we can cater or we can upgrade or we can remove it completely that particular feature by just removing that uh, microservice uh, so that really helps then uh, making the user onboarding a seamless experience with the identity access management system then adopt an mvp approach invest in bringing agility uh, agility helps us a lot in uh, achieving customer satisfaction because uh, you know every time we go with a uh, features uh, implemented customer will come back with the new um, uh, requirements, but customer is also aware that we are on track in uh, delivering the product. So add product tool analytics as discussed, which helps us to save money in eliminating irrelevant tools out of stack, but it also helps us to operate with more agility and act on business insights faster. The tech stack says a lot about the product. In fact, uh, the earlier question was about the Indian culture from somebody, the audience. So it talks a lot about the product company and the engineering culture we are into. The best technologies, we have to get the best people and uh, we get the best product of best people. There's no one perfect stack here, but the agenda is to get close to the business efficiency for uh, greater throughput. Then before deciding on tech stack, understand the key business questions is a primary key you're trying to answer through the SaaS product. Some of the tools help us centralize this data and learn more about the company's performance, and some will provide in-depth the behavioral data, especially the product tool at analytics. It will help us uh, give a lot of uh, user behavioral data to understand the user culture and what he's trying to achieve and where he's focusing on, etc. And yeah, quickly, I would like to cover some of the uh, popular uh, startups uh, tech stack. Uh, first one is a Trello uh, database used is MongoDB. The reason they used uh, MongoDB is because um, for a same in MongoDB database instance, they can keep uh, changing the uh, application versions. So this is one of the key advantages of uh, MongoDB. Then JavaScript uh, a framework, they used uh, CoffeeScript, Cloud Infrastructure, AWS, Backend, Node.js, Frontend, Backbone.js. 
Netflix, uh, they use uh, for database uh, MySQL and Apache Cassandra. There are, they use many more, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. They have a very complex architecture in backend. Then cloud infrastructure, AWS, backend, Python, frontend, ReactJS. In Airbnb, we use uh, database uh, Amazon RDS. Airbnb is one of the uh, you know, product. They have billions of users uh, uh, worldwide, and they constantly they are growing uh, every month in millions. The cloud infrastructure used here is uh, Google Cloud. In fact, it's wrong here. I think this image, they use uh, uh, AWS. Uh, backend Ruby on Rails and frontend React.js. Spotify, uh, they use databases, Kafka, Crunch, Hadoop, Cassandra, and Storm. Kafka is used for streaming. We know Spotify is a music streaming, so Kafka is used to control the streaming features, and Crunch, Hadoop, are all used for processing uh, the streamed data and Cassandra and Storm is used to store the uh, database, uh, data in the database. And cloud infrastructure used here is Google Cloud. Spotify uses backend C++ and Objective-C and frontend Ruby on Rails. So this is a Netflix uh, tech stack. Uh, uh, the DevOps tools, some of the DevOps tools mentioned are Jira, Confluence, Jenkins, uh, SpinMaker, uh, Northern Atlas, and many more, uh, Gradle, Nebula. Uh, mobile frameworks, they use Kotlin and Swift. Frontend, they use React. Uh, then they also use GraphQL to interact with the backend APIs. Um, as backend comprises of services, they have their own uh, uh, Apart from Spring Boot, uh, which is Java based, they also use uh, Netflix, in house Netflix uh, services. They have databases, as mentioned, MySQL, Cassandra, uh, et cetera. And they also have a messaging and streaming service, uh, as mentioned, Kafka. They have an exclusive module for streaming. We know that you know the streaming is the core uh, service of Netflix. Then we have this uh, big data uh, to perform all the business intelligence uh, processing and data storage with the S3, Redshift, uh, Apache Iceberg, Tableau, uh, I just... So there is a, a tech stack uh, reference. Uh, you can visit a stackshare.io wherein you can uh, uh, you know log in with your uh, even Gmail credentials, it will show some of the tech stack tools used by popular uh, you know, SaaS products. I'll just show you here. Now the example here is techshare.io. So this is a tech stack of uh, Shopify. You can uh, look at the explanation of the entire uh, tech stack details of uh, Shopify. Yeah, yeah. So application and data, these are all uh, used, and DevOps tools, these are all used. So this is a community uh, uh, wherein you know uh, tech enthusiasts uh, share uh, the tech stack of uh, each product. So there are many more uh, which you can uh, browse for your reference, and uh, they'll also give us a good analysis of. Uh, you know why they selected that particular tech stack and what are the pros and cons uh, of that particular selecting that particular stack. Yeah, you can get into Uber, Pinterest, Airbnb. Uh, so all the SaaS typical SaaS product uh, tech stacks that you will hear. You can browse it at your convenience. That uh, I hope I have not uh, overboarded. I think I am. Apologies. So, any questions? Uh, I'm happy to ask. Any questions? Me? from anyone? Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask something. Is that uh, do you know some? Uh, Firebase uh, database that it is can be used for is that can be used for uh, integrating with another SQL uh, up SQL cloud maybe yes. if I so, SQL for example I have SQL database in my server then I want to mm -hmm. uh, integrate it with Firebase what what is uh, your recommendation to integrate between Firebase with another SQL uh, DBMS in the cloud 
Yeah, I think if you use a Google Cloud uh, platform, Google Firebase is a good option. Uh, you can still use it uh, with the SQL. However, it is predominantly used uh, uh, well with the MVP stage. But the Google BigQuery uh, is the is the key thing if you really want to get uh, your product on to production. Ah, uh, okay. What uh, is the BigQuery is uh, containing SQL? SQL, yes, it contains a SQL. Uh, yeah, it's a SQL database. database. Yeah, it's a SQL database. Okay. Uh, do you know how to uh, connecting between Firebase and uh, and BigQuery? For example, I have the data from uh, the from BigQuery. Then how I uh, how I connecting between the Firebase and uh, and yeah, I can I can look into it uh, offline. Maybe uh, now. Uh, it may not be relevant because we have to look into a lot of uh, configurations. Uh, things are possible, but yeah, it, it may not be a, a right thing for me to do it now. But you can contact me offline. I can help you. You can uh, uh, make a note of my email ID. I'll see what I can do. Offline. Yeah, you can see her email ID on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So here one comment I want to make is that uh, we didn't talk about uh, vendor lock-in. So for example, if we select Amazon Redshift as a part of a tech mm -hmm. stack, it makes mm -hmm. it difficult for us to move to some other cloud, let's say. Yeah, it's so a wonderful point. We should keep that yes. in mind. Migration. Uh, yeah. yeah. Migration is uh, becomes a challenge if we uh, change it tomorrow. Yeah, I agree with you. I take that point. Any other questions from others? So thank you, Lakshmi, for that wonderful talk. Uh, many of us in the audience are developers. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most of us, you know, when we think of tech stack, typically we think of front end and back end. But what your uh, presentation has shown is that uh, there are so many more components to a tech stack, not just front end and back end. We have to think about testing. We have to think about deployment, monitoring the app. And uh, you also made, made a very important point. Your uh, app can be very simple, but because there are so mm -hmm. many components, there is complexity. How you wire all these things together. So yes. you need an automated test environment, and automated test cases as well. So all these are additional uh, inputs, which I'm sure our audience benefited from. So thanks for that uh, talk. A lot of insights, a lot of information, useful information. Uh, just one more, I think you. I think. Uh, Raja, go ahead. Yeah, you forgot about mobile part. Mobile part, I touched it here and there. I mentioned about Ionic yes. uh, and uh, you know hybrid if needed, Flutter and React native. Uh, so. Uh, don't you think if Android and you know uh, iOS, we should not think about yeah. the native application? Uh, I, Ionic and Flutter support Android and iOS, so uh, maybe I did not use the keyword Android and iOS, but that apparently means uh, you no, know, it supports uh, mobile frameworks, uh, supports Android and. IOS. Okay, you mean only um, these are all web based, right? Whatever you are saying, I am a React native, JavaScript based. There, uh, they, we can have a mobile based uh, application as well, exclusive mobile also. We can create an application for Android only. We can also create an application for iOS only in using those frameworks. Okay. Yes. But when it comes to SaaS, I think uh, most of the things are backend, so they are equally applicable for mobile and web. Yeah, backend is a, a common uh, thing for mobile and uh, web. Uh, depends on the features. If there is any truncation that a couple of SaaS product uh, owners do, is okay, mobile, I'll provide only these features and uh, not everything. If you need more features, you go to web. It's a business decision. Uh, but yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, it is the same interface uh, to backend uh, that we use. Only the front end changes. Because uh, to accommodate a mobile interface is different. Uh, the UI look and feel and the interfaces will be different from web. So the front end uh, uh, will change. 
Okay, any other questions? Okay, then thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thanks, uh, Lakshmi, yeah. for your time. And uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of effort yeah. has gone into making the slides. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Arvind, for the opportunity, and thank you all for uh, attending this session. Thanks.